Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our presenter. We're very fortunate to have with us tonight Eric Radke. Eric is the president of Sporties Academy. He is also the chief flight instructor at Sporties Academy. That's the educational arm of Sporties Pilot Shop, both uh, in aircraft training in our flight school in Batavia, Ohio, and also the people that do all of our many online training courses, like our Learn to Fly course and Instrument Rating course. Eric is a seasoned uh, flight instructor, uh, also a, a long career as both a, an airline pilot and a corporate pilot. So he's flown everything from trainers in the right seat to jets in the left seat and is going to bring that wealth of experience tonight to help us get current and get confident and get out there and flying. So without further ado, Eric, take it away. John, thank you so much. Very generous introduction, I will say. So like all of you on tonight, uh, longtime pilot, love to fly. I'm not immune um, from being a little bit rusty in some of the skills and some of the knowledge area. So I come to you tonight, I think, bringing some of that firsthand experience, um, in, you know, both, again, from my own standpoint and, and background, but, but also with the volume of training and customers we interact with day in and day out at our world headquarters in Batavia, Ohio, Claremont County Airport. Uh, work with with numerous individuals uh, year to year that are in various stages of coming back into aviation. Maybe that's someone who's reasonably current, who's just due for a flight review. That could be someone who's been uh, out of kind of flying the daily flying five, ten years plus. Um, so and everywhere in between. So it kind of runs the gamut. So with that in mind, we want to kind of start things out with a with a poll question um, to help us get a sense for where our audience is at right now from your experience level. Um, I think regardless of what we find out here, uh, you'll see that we're gonna have, I think, good information to share with everyone, but this will give kind of everyone um, listening in or participating tonight some idea of where everyone stands. So I'll give this just a second for the results to come in. Well, thanks for participating. So um, this surprises me maybe a little bit to see that the majority are reasonably current. Um, almost half of you have signaled that you are current already, but you're always trying to, to gain a little refresher. You're always trying to grow. Uh, you're to be commended for that. Um, and another approximately third of you uh, indicated that you were just n looking to knock a little rust off. So uh, again, some of this will be um, some, some, some basics in terms of review for, you, for, for those of you who are current, but we will have some good information and some things that are probably brand new to you if you've, are, if, if you've been out or away from uh, flying for maybe a little bit more of an extended period of time. So here's just a, a high level overview look at what we will cover this evening. We're going to talk first and foremost, what are those legal steps? What's kind of step one, two, and three in terms of getting back into the airplane from a legal standpoint and also from a practical standpoint? We're going to highlight some of those things that are probably brand new. And then uh, as you prepare for actually getting in the airplane, we're going to hit some of those core topics that you would expect out of a, a flight review, which includes some airspace, regulations, weather, uh, and also some discussion on um, some newer technology that you have access to. Also talk about some flight planning and again, some, some tools and resources that have made that process a lot more accurate, a lot safer, a lot easier, less time consuming, all those things. And then maybe some tips to help you stay active and, and keep you involved so that you're not kind of back into this category once again a year from now thinking, wow, I need to dive right back in and knock all this rust off again. So with that, steps to getting back from a legal standpoint, what do I have to do in order, if I'm a licensed pilot, in order to be able to act as PIC again? Well, if you take a close look at that pilot certificate, you will know that it does not show an expiration date. Once you have earned that certificate, it is yours. There are some things we have to do from a currency standpoint, of course, um, to stay legal to carry passengers and to be able to utilize the privilege of that certificate, you do have to have a flight review recorded every two years, every 24 months, 
you had to have the, uh, the the flight review accomplished. It is not a check ride. That's a common misconception, misnomer in aviation. You are not participating in a flight review to take a test. A flight instructor who is eligible to provide a flight review, they can't take anything away from you. This is just working towards a minimum standard. This is just ensuring that you are safe, um, for the benefit of all involved to exercise those privileges of your um, pilot certificate. So what it, what a flight review entails, there are the basic minimum requirements that an instructor is required to follow, but a really good flight review is going to be custom, custom to you. Um, I would encourage everyone who is coming up for a flight review or at your next flight review, become an active participant take some ownership, decide for yourself what it is that, that you wish to accomplish, and then, you know, kind of make that your own. So beyond that bare minimum that a flight instructor is required to do, you can help shape that experience, um, again, to get the, the most benefit uh, for the type of flying that you are going to do. Um, so we've, we've decided that, and now the next step is let's, let's reach out and let's find that local flight school, that, that flight instructor um, who could who could kind of lead us through that effort. There's some, some good resources out there. Uh, we have a directory, as a matter of fact, the studentpilotnews.com, uh, a great internet resource uh, that's published and maintained by Sporties where you can access a directory. Uh, you could reach out to both the National Association of Flight Instructors, NAFI, Society of Aviation Flight Educators, SAFE, um, for potential contact as well, and probably a, a really good a uh, fantastic local resource would just be other pilots that you happen to know. Um, take a trip to the local airport. If you haven't been in a while, introduce yourself, talk around, just kind of ask and see who might be a good fit for you in order to be able to accomplish that. Next step, uh, what type of medical qualification is going to be required? So it's possible if you've been out for some time that potentially you let your medical certification lapse. So number one, something somewhat new, you need to decide what class medical certificate you may wish to obtain, or a question even to ask before that, do you need a medical certificate at all? And we're going to get into a little bit more about this new uh, pathway towards medical qualification known as basic med. The other thing I'd recommend uh, in this process is consider some supplemental uh, video-based training. Um, video-based training material is fantastic in that it's usually always self-paced, access as much as you would like, view, review material. You, you have the option to really customize kind of that ground school portion of your flight review. Um, Sporties does offer a fantastic flight review program you could consider there. Rusty Pilot Seminar, uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA, uh, host these dedicated Rusty Pilot Seminars all over the country. Um, you can search for Rusty Pilot Seminars, visit the AOPA website, and, and perhaps find an in-person uh, seminar too, if that would be more to your liking. Legally, in order to carry passengers, so once we've kind of gone beyond the flight review step, what will you need to do from a, a, la a landing currency perspective per 6157 to carry passengers? Well, it states that you do have to have within the preceding 90 days, three takeoffs and three landings. Uh, that has to be in the same category and class of aircraft. If you are regaining currency at night, which is separate from daytime hours, those landings do have to be during that time period of one hour after sunset to one hour before sunrise. Here's where the when we discuss night landings and night currency, and when you have to have position lights on, this is when these definitions of night can get a little confusing. So there's really three kind of definitions we have to remember. If given my way, if I ruled the world here, they, I'd probably have that down to two. But in the FAA speak, um, there is that period of between sunset and sunrise, and that's where when we're, we are required to have position lights illuminated on our aircraft. Then there's also the official definition of night, at which point you would be logging night experience, and that's the end of evening twilight to the beginning of morning twilight. And then there's this kind of third 
category here, which is only specific to landing requirements and landing currency in carrying passengers. And that has to be this time period, one hour after sunset to one hour before sunrise. Back to this medical pathway, again, considering if you need to renew your medical certification or if you may go the route of this new pathway known as basic med, if your medical expire, expired prior to July 15th, 2006, so dig out that old medical certification, see what kind of expiration date you have there. Um, you would have to, whether you're going to ultimately go the route of basic med, you will have to have another traditional visit to the aviation medical examiner, AME, and you would have to obtain a first, second, or third class medical certificate. If you're in this category where you fly for compensation, if you're an airline pilot, uh, if you're a commercial pilot, again, that's being paid for your flying services and you're required to hold a first or second class medical, you're going to need to renew that medical certification, the traditional first, second, or third class. However, if you are not in either one of those two categories, if you've had a valid medical certificate after July 14, 2006, you could potentially go the route of basic med. Uh, you also do not have to have a traditional medical certificate if you're going to limit your flying to gliders or also flying under light sport rules. Uh, light sport rules only require that you hold a current valid driver's license as your medical certification. And this is a good kind of time to underscore the importance, no matter what pathway you may choose, whether it's traditional medical or basic med or driver's license men in the case of sport pilot rules, it's always incumbent, it's always the responsibility day-to-day, flight-to-flight for us pilots to self-certify. Um, we're only seeing that medical professional once every few years, as a matter of fact, and all that time in between, it's really up to us to decide whether or not we meet the requirements of that medical certification. If you are gonna go the traditional medical certification route, there are the three classes of med, of med certifications. The, uh, these expiration dates, depending on how long you've been away from flying, these could be new uh, here. So I'll just very quickly mention um, that the kind of change in medical duration occurs when you turn age 40. And, and that's based on when you actually take the medical exam. So for anyone who's kind of, who's flying privately, business pleasure, you're not working as a commercial pilot or an airline pilot. If you're under the age of uh, 40, when you obtain the medical cert, it's good for 60 months, five years. If you are over the age of 40, it is good for 24 months. If you do go up to first class medical, which is required, if you're an airline pilot exercising ATP privileges, under 40, you can use those privileges for 12 months. It's six months if you're over 40. Uh, I will point out on the first class, because there are pilots that are flying privately, business pleasure, that do opt to earn higher level medical certifications for whatever reason. Uh, second class, first class, oftentimes there's not really a pricing difference if you go to an AME, but the pricing difference you will incur is if, if you do have to get an EKG. So an EKG is only required of first class medicals and, and it happens when you get your first first class medical at age 35 or older, and then once you hit age 40, you have to have the EKG with every medical thereafter. Second class, 12 months, and it's worth noting that um, these classes of medical certifications, they essentially degrade in, in privileges. So even if you earn a first class, you could still be flying under third class privileges for that full five years or 24 months, depending on your age. Now, again, if you met those basic qualifications that I outlined for the new, new-ish basic med pathway, that's great news. This was a big win for all of general aviation. This was designed to relieve some of that financial burden uh, of going to see an aviation medical examiner incurring that expense by being able to kind of weave this basic med criteria into an ordinary visit uh, with, a, with a family physician, for example. Uh, many of us, you know, have a primary care physician. You're likely getting a physical maybe every year, maybe every couple of years. 
So the way the basic med was structured, it was designed to be able to earn this basic med certification along with your normal ordinary care. Um, so again, if you've held that valid medical, anytime after July 14, 2006, you're just gonna be doing that uh, personal or business flying, you could be eligible for basic med. A few of the other restrictions to note on basic med. It is limited to operating aircraft with max five passengers or six seats. Um, so, you know, your Bonanzas, uh, Saratogas, things like that. Uh, the aircraft cannot be over 6,000 pounds and you are restricted. You cannot operate in uh, Class A airspace. So it's 18,000 feet below and you are also restricted to uh, a speed of 250 knots. And these are all certification speeds. Uh, and this is all certification in terms of seats as well. It's worth pointing out. Since this was first launched in the United States, basic med privileges have also been accepted uh, in the Bahamas and also Mexico. So there's there's quite a bit of travel you could do uh, under just the basic med requirements. If you are going the route of basic med, uh, there is something that you have to do still every two years, even though you're not visiting a traditional AME. Number one, every two years you have to complete an online training course. Um, there's two of these courses that are FA eligible right now for this credit, uh, one provided by AOPA, one provided by Mayo Clinic. Uh, so you have to take that and you have to document, record in your logbook um, would be my advice that you've completed this training. And then every four years, you're required to complete this um, FAA checklist, this FAA-issued checklist with a state-licensed physician. Um, and so that is the piece that, again, in the course of your, your ordinary care, you can likely complete. Uh, this is kind of the first time I will, I will note that in the handout section of the GoToWebinar uh, platform, I do have as a download what that checklist actually looks like. So if you're curious about basic med or if it might be right for you and that type of checklist, some of which is completed by you, the pilot, some of which is completed by the physician, you can download that, you can open it, take a look at it and see what that's all about. Uh, also, and I'll ask my uh, our facilitator, John, um, why we're talking here, uh, to send this link out to all of you, but we do have a very comprehensive um, kind of plain language, plain speak uh, pilot's guide to basic med available on our studentpilotnews.com website. So John will send a direct link out that out to that in the chat window, and you're welcome to uh, explore more um, as you get some time there. If you do decide that you are renewing your traditional medical, uh, those applications are now done exclusively online. You do have to register for an account and complete your medical application at FAA Med Express, and then go to visit that AME. We already talked about the medical durations. So just search Med Express and create that account if you don't have one. And then it's recommended that you take a physical printout copy of your application to the AME. If you don't already have an AME, you can also search AMEs in your area, uh, just an open um, generic Google search for aviation medical examiners should lead you there. You can search by zip codes, by the state area, and you can also, again, visit the local airport and just talk to your uh, fellow pilots. Now, if I piqued anyone's curiosity by alluding to the sport pilot uh, requirements early on, uh, and the ability to fly with with essentially the, the driver's license standard uh, for medicals. If you are an existing licensed private pilot and you just um, will now choose to go the route of driver's license medical, there's really nothing additional you have to do other than follow those basic steps for currency that we outlined at the beginning of the uh, presentation get your flight review, and then simply let your medical lapse. It's nothing you have to hand back in, just let it expire, and you can start flying sport pilot aircraft um, on, that, on that driver's license medical. Very easy transition. I wanna shift to some newer technology, um, which is hopefully something that all of you will embrace or be excited about, because that's you know certainly the way I see it. Um, 
but we have, you know, what we have available to us and what is becoming more and more commonplace as these retrofit packages become available and as the pricing for all of these, um, th this new digital solid state instrumentation becomes available, we're seeing not only full glass panels, but we're starting to see these hybrid uh, panels now in, in many aircraft where maybe you have some combination of traditional instrumentation, but you have these slide in replacement uh, solid state digital instrumentation. Uh, the old mechanical gyros are quickly becoming a thing of the past. The instrumentation is more accurate, it's more reliable, it's more durable, it's oftentimes much easier to interpret. Um, all these are kind of positive, positive, positive. And again, the, the, the cost of this type of equipment is going down, down, down. Uh, so if you, you haven't kind of peeked at uh, the flight decks of some of the um, local you know, flight school aircraft uh, or some friends that have airplanes sitting in hangars, you'd probably be quite surprised by what you, what you may find these days. So I think that's a great thing uh, in terms of making it easier to transition back to the flight deck. Speaking of technology making things easier, electronic flight bags, which is essentially utilizing tablets um, to, to access information, to store information, uh, that has just taken the aviation world by storm. It's, it's transformed the way, we, the way we fly, the way we access data information. Uh, it's really been a revolution, nothing short of a revolution in aviation, and, and this has been the case in many, many industries. Uh, since the since the iPad uh, specifically was introduced, but we now have access uh, to all the traditional charting data, pilot manuals, checklist, whatever the case may be. If there was anything that used to be available only on paper on the flight deck, it can be available to you on the convenience of a tablet, um, iPad, iPhone, whatever the case may be. Um, what makes it What's what's great about that transition, if you're not accustomed to using this equipment in an aviation application, uh, you know, I'm, my, my suspicion is if we polled the audience, 95% of you are using some form of a smartphone. Uh, you probably have a tablet. Um, this is a, a very easy transition to start making use of some of these great aviation apps that are now available to us on the, on the flight deck. There's no legal requirement to have paper charting data. If you have digital access, electronic, ac electronic access to this information, which we do now all have uh, at, a, at a very attractive price point, there's no need to, you know, store reams and reams of paper data in those old, uh, old in those old flight bags. Um, probably the best look, a more in-depth look at everything kind of tablet, iPad related, and as it relates to aviation is another great resource, free subscription, uh, free exploration around is Sporty's iPad Pilot News.com. So if you're not a subscriber interested in what's going on uh, in the digital world uh, on the flight deck, uh, that would be a great resource for you to explore. Um, if you're just getting started, don't know where to start in terms of uh, what are the best apps to kind of go explore in terms of having to all access to all this great aeronautical data and also flight planning tools because of these are all this all this pre-flight planning work has all been integrated into these individual apps. There's a few of some of the market leaders uh, that you should definitely check out. Um, I'll stop short of making any single recommendation because, um, you know, there's room for, for many different options. Um, the type of features that they, that they give you uh, are very similar. Um, how you interact, the, the user interface is slightly different. So I would say, you know, go explore and just see what, you know, works best for you and your type of flying. Talk to other pilots. Uh, Everyone, all these ch charting app, flight planning app providers do generally have the ability or offer the ability for you to download and try these apps uh, free of charge uh, for some time period. So once you're ready to, to try these out on the flight deck, take advantage of the free downloads and just kind of see what you like best would be the advice. And taking this a step further than just the charting and flight planning data, uh, you also nowadays have, have very um, cost-effective access to, to weather, traffic, GPS data, uh, all on these tablet devices too, and that's via 
uh, the ADSB automatic dependent surveillance broadcast uh, system. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in the coming slides. But essentially, it is a um, it's a free government network of ground-based stations that that transmit again subscri subscription free, uh, free to pilots to use as long as you have the equipment to receive the information. Um, you can get all access to all this information. Again, weather, traffic, GPS data. Many of these portable devices that receive this information have built-in attitude heading and reference systems, so it can also be like having your own uh, your backup complete glass cockpit systems on these devices too. Uh, so feature rich in these in these very small uh, cost effective receivers. We're going to move to airspace. Again, one of these core kind of flight review required topics. Not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we're just going to run down through the basics of airspace related starting with kind of the most restrictive and working our way down just as a reminder class a airspace that most restrictive that's where kind of much of that jet traffic and turbo jet uh, turboprop traffic operates above 18,000 feet not shown on vfr charts it's ifr charts only you need a transponder you need to be on an ifr flight plan instrument rated Class B airspace, that's the airspace that surrounds some of the, the largest, most congested, busiest airspace around the country. That's your Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles, Denver, New York, Boston, those types of areas. Uh, generally, that, that Class B airspace is going to be about 30 mile radius, but they can be custom. Uh, requires communications, requires that you have as a VFR pilot that you have explicit permission to enter and transition uh, Class B airspace. Class B airspace is limited uh, to student pilots, uh, meaning that there has to be endorsements uh, provided to be able to operate if you're, if you're not a private pilot. Um, kind of a key takeaway here is remembering that permission piece when it comes to Class B airspace, and also when it comes to VFR requirements, because I have that listed here, you're seeing that on the screen, the basic VFR weather minimums. Um, you know, it's it's there's there's it's worthy to have many of these basic VFR weather minimums memorized, and we've all probably over the years learned these uh, different mnemonics and and how we remember the the visibility, the cloud clearance requirements. But what I would say is establish your own kind of personal minimums related to what you're comfortable operating visually, which I would submit or I'd recommend as a bare minimum is going to be five miles, the definition of VFR. You get into marginal conditions when you're less than five miles. And anything marginal should definitely raise a red flag. But set something as your personal minimum of five or so miles, and you really don't have to concern yourself a whole lot with having these um, bare minimum uh, VFR requirements uh, memorized from airspace to airspace. Um, within 30 miles uh, of most of those airports, you do have the the 30 mile mode C veil, um, which requires the um, not only the transponder but also now requires uh, ADS that the, the aircraft be equipped with ADSB out. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what ADSB out is all about. Uh, a little bit further on in the presentation. Class C airspace indicated by that solid magenta on the sectional chart, generally five to 10 miles in radius up to about 4,000 feet AGL. Uh, you do have to have the mode C transponder, ADSB as well, which we'll get to, and two-way communications established. So a differentiator between the class C and the class B you only have to have two-way communications established, meaning ATC has acknowledged your transmission in some way. With Class B, you ex specifically have to have a clearance and here a clearance to be able to operate. Class D airspace found at a lot of reliever airports uh, in the larger metro area, the dash blue line on the sectional chart. Um, radius can vary, speed limit 200 knots, uh, generally ground up to 2,500 feet AGL, again, two-way radio communication established. Uh, class E transition airspace, that shaded magenta color, um, surface up to uh, beginning, excuse me, at 700 feet AGL, 
uh, outside the shaded magenta, the class E begins at 1200 feet AGL and those basic VFR weather minimums, of course. Class E to the surface, not nearly as common, but you see that with the dash magenta line. Um, same basic VFR weather minimums you're accustomed to. Some special use airspace areas that you may not have thought of in quite some time. Uh, the military operations area is indica indicated on the left. Alert area is indicated on the right. Military operations area is, is, military, is military training taking place. There are, there's no restriction in military operations areas to VFR traffic. Um, you can, you can tr transition without approval, without checking on active times. Um, it's always wise, in my opinion, uh, to be aware of when military operations areas are active, which you can find um, on, on your charting source, whether it's digital or whether it's paper. Um, but there's no other restrictions other than being aware that that activity could be taking place. Alert areas um, are areas, again, that, that are not legally restricted in terms of transitioning, but they do identify or alert you to high volumes of, of aviation activity that are going on. So this, this could be congested airspace. Um, so that th those are areas that you need to be particularly vigilant when it comes to uh, collision avoidance and an awareness of, of everything going on around you, of course. Warning areas um, essentially are the same type of activity that are happening in military operations areas. They just extend off the coast of the US. Air de defense identification zones, uh, indications noted there on the right, um, that, that marks kind of the international border around the United States. Um, if you're transitioning, you best be on a flight plan. Required that you be either on an IFR flight plan or um, a v, a, a VF, an international VFR flight plan uh, in order to transition that area. Or you may be met with a very unwelcome uh, escort uh, from there on out. Prohibited areas, kind of the name says it all. Uh, any, anything marked prohibited, that's a no transition zone. From a regulatory standpoint, it does allow, if you did have explicit permission from the regulating agency, it is possible um, that you could transition from, can't, could transition prohibited airspace, but the key takeaway, the learning point is prohibited means I can't go there. Restricted areas, um, they're only going to be restricted in operations while they are active. So there's a possibility you could transition restricted areas, but you're going to need to contact the controlling agency. Let me reference back um, to some of those great features, technology, technology features we mentioned early on. This is when access to digital charting sources, gosh, this is when they, they just really shine because what, you, what, you're, what we have the ability to do now on these charting applications is simply with a button tap, we can pull up all the, the, the information, the necessary information on these um, special airspace areas. So we could tap and click on restricted 6407 and it's gonna tell us altitudes, it's gonna tell us days and times of use, it's gonna give us a frequency of the controlling agency, and there we go. We kind of have everything we need to be able to make contact and see if we could possibly transition the area. Temporary flight restrictions um, are just that. They're, they're blocks of airspace that can be restricted and are restricted at certain times. Um, uh, one of the probably areas of, or the temporary flight restrictions that catches a lot of pilots off guard because of how quickly they appear and disappear is this blanket temporary flight restriction over uh, sp sporting venues. Uh, specifically, there is a, a notum that restricts flight within a three mile radius up to 3,000 feet above the ground of outdoor sporting venues with a capacity of 30,000 seats or more. Uh, these are venues that host Major League Baseball, football, NFL, NCAA Division I football, or essentially the top um, uh, racing car series, NASCAR, IndyCar. Um, so if you're in an area, if you regularly transition an area that has 
any major sports franchises or again division one universities uh, you it is up to you to to keep tabs on when these venues are going to be in operation when they're going to be in use and avoid that airspace uh, these extend from an hour before game time um, so to speak and to an hour after game time um, again another benefit of having access to the charting apps uh, is that most of these charting apps and via the ADSB broadcast will give you this information will show you these TFR areas will identify these sporting uh, venues and the same with presidential TFRs. so presidential TFRs are quite restrictive as well and they essentially follow the vice the president uh, or the vice president around everywhere they go um, the presidential TFRs these are typically uh, have two different two different areas um, uh, essentially a prohibited no-fly area at the center core uh, and then a slightly less restrictive outer core area where aircraft on a flight plan can be transitioning uh, but these go all the way up to 18,000 feet. They can be 30 miles typically in diameter in total. Uh, and again, they can, um, the, the times that they're in operation uh, can vary and they can certainly move as the, uh, as the president may, may move. The um, TFRs that follow the vice president around are a little, um, a little smaller. Uh, typically more like the sporting venue TFRs, that three mile and 3,000 feet. Um, but anytime we're nearing an election season is, is a time when, when everyone needs to be paying close attention to these TFRs. If you're using a charting app, if you have access to the ADSB broadcast, this makes it very simple and very easy to find these TFRs. Um, but you can search uh, the, the FAA website for TFRs and you can just make that search um, these all get mapped as well. These all get charted. Uh, so it's not just textual that we're seeing these TFRs, but always something to be aware of. There's, there's more TFRs. If you've been away from flying for several years, there's more TFRs that are happening on these temporary basis than really ever before. Also want to point out, especially if you're an East Coast flyer or anywhere near uh, the Washington DC area, uh, there is a block of airspace, um, 60 nautical mile radius from the um, DCA VOR that is known as the Washington DC Special Flight Rules Area. There's a lot of specific nuances and rules to operating in and out of this airspace and it also requires that you be trained um, and there's a free online course that you can accomplish at fasafety.gov in order to be able to operate in and out. But essentially, you always have to be on a discrete transponder code. Um, so you always have to be communicating. ATC needs to know who you are and where you're going is the best way to kind of summarize operations within the Washington DC special flight rules area. A note on ADSB. So uh, ADSB, we've used the acronym several times, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast automatic and that there's really nothing for the pilot to do dependent and that it is dependent on a position source uh, surveillance broadcast so what is it well it, it's a technology essentially it's a technology that's part of FAA's next gen initiative um, way over budget way over time that really doesn't mean anything now because it's fantastic if you're a pilot flying with ADSB it was worth it, right? It's um, it's all this information that we typically only had available to us uh, on the ground via an internet connection. This can now be made available to us in the air. Um, two different pieces to this ADSB puzzle. There's the out, okay? There's the ADSB broadcast. So this is based on equipment that is installed in the airplane. So for aircraft that are flying in most of the controlled airspace around the country, it is now a requirement that the aircraft itself be equipped with this ADSB out capability. And that is because ADSB is essentially becoming the replacement or is the replacement for ground-based radar systems, uh, which are dated, they're becoming obsolete. So now ATC is making use of this GPS uh, source to be able to control air traffic. 
Um, so in pretty much all the airspace that you used to have to have a transponder, you still have to have that, but it also has, the aircraft also has to be equipped with this ADS-B out. So it's constantly transmitting an aircraft position, not only back to ATC, but also to other aircraft that have receiving equipment. So that's the other side of the coin. The ADS-B in or the ADS receiving end, which is optional, no requirement for it, but it does offer the ability to display this free government ground-based information. Um, ADSB in receivers, a couple different options here. Aircraft can be have this type of equipment installed, and there can be panel-mounted uh, display screens that allow you to see this information. But there's all this, also this entire market of these portable ADSB receivers, uh, much lower price points, can move with you, can move from aircraft to aircraft if you're a club member, if you're a, a renter pilot, and it will allow you to, to sync up well, with some kind of portable tablet, iPad, um, and be able to display all this, this ADSB information. And coming through this ADSB broadcast is weather information, all the weather data you can think of, um, METARs, TAFs, pilot reports, airmet SIGMETs. Some of the latest additions have been lightning information, turbulence, cloud tops, freezing levels, um, all the all the traditional text uh, weather reports, of course, and even NOTAMs and TFRs. And there's also a traffic element to this. Uh, the ADSB broadcast will show traffic information around you as well. So a wealth of information clearly uh, at your fingertips if you have this ability to receive that ADSB broadcast. That airspace, as I just mentioned, um, that's going to be all of Class A airspace. Class A airspace where ADSB is required. Um, Class B and above Class B, including that 30 mile uh, Mode C veil. All the Class C airspace plus the airspace above it, Class D, Class E, uh, above 10,000, uh, except when it's within 2,500 feet above the ground. So pretty much, again, everywhere you used to have to have a transponder, you now also have to be ADSB out equipped. ADSB out is only installed equipment on the aircraft, aircraft specific. There's nothing portable you can buy to comply with the ADSB out requirement. Going to take a shift to regulations. Um, everyone's favorite topic, of course, Part 91 regulations. Um, this is not going to be an exhaustive exploration of regulations to know or be aware of, um, but we've come up with a few that maybe you haven't thought of in a while that could affect you, especially in your day-to-day -day life. And change of address is one, and, and this is a this is a gotcha, and I, I, I led with this because I've, I've seen pilots run into this all too often where they forget about this regulatory requirement um, that requires a notification to the FAA uh, within 30 days of any change of address. Used to be a little more of a chore because there used to have to be a paper form that was completed and sent into the FAA, but now it is very simple because there's a way to do it online. So in about 30 seconds, uh, if you have changed, do have a change of address, um, you should um, notify the FAA. And if it's been longer than the 30 days, you should still notify the FAA of your address change per 6160. Maintenance requirements. Many of you probably remember the old acronym AVIATE, which still applies here. Uh, in order to for the aircraft to be airworthy, it had to have undergone an annual inspection every 12 months, VOR, and VOR check within 30 days, that's the, that's the pilot uh, VOR check every 30 days for IFR flights, the 100 hour, and again for IFR flight, your altimeter pedostatic check every 24 and the transponder check, and if required, the ELT on an annual basis. FAR 91-117, boy, this is a season when um, Speaking of, because um, we're going to talk a little about over the over the counter drugs and some of its effects, this is kind of the season where many of us are uh, kind of taking some regimen of cold and flu medicine on a regular basis. Well, let's f first talk about alcohol consumption. As a reminder, that's prohibited within eight hours of flight. Uh, what's become an industry-wide best practice 
is extending that to at least 12 hours, if not 24 hours. Everyone handles that a little bit different, of course. Um, it's it, the blanket um, statement made in 9117 is that you cannot fly while under the influence. That essentially goes without saying, or with a blood alcohol content of 0.04% or greater. And also, which is a, probably a little less scrutinized, but probably affects many of us in a more um, direct and a more consistent manner, is that it also states you can't operate an aircraft um, while using any drugs that affects the person's faculties in any way that's contrary to safety. And I highlighted here some of the medications that the FAA has specifically listed on its do not fly list and antihistamines is certainly one um, that we we know, you know, through surveying, um, is one of probably the more not intentionally but more abused medications um, that are taking. Uh, also on that list, if you haven't considered it in quite some time, um, are going to be muscle relaxant relaxants, anything that's considered experimental, weight loss medications are a part of that. Uh, any controlled substances, so you know, med medical marijuana and 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 legal marijuana use is kind of all the rage right now. But it's worth noting that that is still illegal at the federal level, uh, and the FAA considers it uh, a non-issuance, non-medical issuance, uh, any controlled substance, and also have that, of course, on the do not uh, fly list. Narcotic pain relievers are part of that. Um, any type of behavioral medication. Um, anything like that. So again, it, it a lot of it is, is common sense, but if it affects the person's faculties, again, it's kind of a no-fly item. A few questions that you might consider um, as you evaluate your fitness for flight um, are things like, you know, how am I trending right now? Um, how do I feel right now? Is it, am I on the upswing? Am I on the downswing? If you've taken any medication in the last five days, uh, that's generally that time period where you may need to look a little bit closely at um, the type of medication you're, you're taking, what the active ingredient potentially is, side effects, that type of thing. Are you noticeably sick? You know, are people asking you, uh, you know, wow, are you better? Or wow, it, it looks like you need to rest. Maybe you should go home for the day, things like that. If you started getting other people noticing things like that, that's when you really should take a second look uh, and a close look at your kind of fitness for flight at that point. Um, some kind of brief guidelines if you are using any medications, especially the kind of over-the-counter medications, um, kind of as a step one, you'll want to always make note of the active ingredient. Um, the FAA reminds us that a single active ingredient is usually preferred because it's just it's it's easier to kind of spot identify and then make uh, an assessment of whether or not something we could be flying with um, read the label very carefully any obvious warnings like do not use machinery or may cause drowsiness those are definitely no fly type items and it's also the recommended practice and guideline uh, per the FAA Medical Office, that if you are taking any of these types of medications that could affect your awareness, your faculties in any manner, that you wait a period of five times the dosing interval before you operate the aircraft. I have a couple examples there. If it says take every four to six hours, which is fairly common for many of the cold and flu meds, um, that's waiting 30 hours, six times five, uh, to ensure that the medication and its effects are all the way through uh, your system. Um, also, I'll point here, I have, um, th there's another resource in the handout section uh, for the webinar that's a, a fairly new guide that was issued by the FAA, which is really a fantastic, almost overdue resource. And it's an actual listing um, of, of different popular over-the-counter medications. And it, it lists you, it, it takes you through a little bit of a checklist on how to make some of this evaluation, and then it gives you some specific examples of certain medications, and it puts you kind of in a fly or a no-fly category. So really strongly encourage you to take a look at that over-the-counter medication guide for pilots. 
that's in the handout section of the GoToWebinar platform. Continuing on regulations, a reminder that FAR 91103, it's kind of the gotcha catch-all regulation um, that specifies that pilots are responsible before each flight to come become familiar with all the available information concerning that flight. That's a lot. Um, TFRs, NOTAMs, weather, of course, goes without saying. NOTAMs is certainly a big one and can catch a lot of people off guard. The NOTAM system has gone through um, a lot of quality upgrades. It's kind of an entirely revamped system that makes accessing those NOTAMs and interpreting those NOTAMs uh, much easier these days, especially if you're accessing that NOTAM information through some of the digital resources we have available. Um, so that's, again, another great benefit of accessing much of this information digitally. Fuel requirements. Uh, fuel requirements are outlined in 91151. The regulatory minimum, 30 minutes for daytime flying, 45 minutes for night flying. My advice, Eric's advice, always shoot for an hour. Just like I talked about, always make your five mile visibility, your bare minimum VFR weather flying. Uh, I'll go with the one hour is the bare minimum uh, fuel reserve requirement. A couple of additional resources too, we're not gonna explore all these additional resources in tonight's presentation, but also in the handout section, you'll see um, two different uh, kind of pre-flight planning tools that I would encourage you to explore a little bit further. Uh, the first is the Single Pilot Resource Management Guide. Many of, many of us in GA are operating single pilots, so all this information is very applicable. Um, this will explore the, the, the FAA I'm Safe checklist of whether you're fit for flying, and then also the flight risk assessment tool handout, which will help you if you haven't done a lot of, or given a lot of meaningful thought to developing um, this system or structure of personal weather minimums, this risk assessment tool uh, will help you a tremendous amount in that respect. Um, some basics on weather, um, you know, as you get back into flying, knocking the rust off or, or start making evaluations, uh, an analysis on weather conditions and whether or not we have we have go or no go conditions. Um, important point here is start several days out and start with the big weather picture. This can be anything from uh, TV weather to um, internet weather. You want to have a general awareness where the frontal systems are, where's the precipitation, where's the convective activity, where is good VFR weather, where are there big patches or big blocks of IFR weather. That gives you that big picture look. Where do you get some of these resources uh, for weather planning? Again, all these great charting apps that I've talked about have access to it. Uh, two online resources that I want to point out is aviationweather.gov and also 1-800-WXBrief.com. Yeah, if you're a pilot that was flying around um, in the days where your only source of a pre-flight weather briefing was calling up the weather briefer, this is gonna be an easy domain for you to remember, the 1-800-WXBrief. You can still call on the phone and talk to a briefer. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You get a professional weather evaluator that can give you some, um, some really keen insight uh, but there's also, um, you know, a lot of pilots that have gone the route of, of doing these self-briefings and working through their own system. Uh, and there's a lot of fantastic resources uh, on both of these sites in order to help us do that. If you follow the path of 1-800-WXBrief.com, that gives you the ability to create an account and, and get standard weather briefings, just like you would have done um, by calling a weather briefer. Again, several days out, looking at that big weather picture, you have your online resources, the prognostic charts that we have give us up to a seven-day outlook. We now have extended convective forecasts that we can look three days out for convective activity. We have freezing level data and freezing level forecasts that we can look at up to 18 hours in advance uh, if IFR flying in icy conditions is a potential for what you may be doing. And then we have convective forecasts that give us an eight-hour um, eight look in the future. B 
beginning with that big picture, this is kind of how I would break things down. A look at adverse conditions is typically how a standard uh, weather brief would go. That's looking at convective segments, segments, and then air mats. Uh, graphical air mats, G air mats are a, a wonderful, relatively new tool that we have available to us via the charting apps, via aviationweather.gov. Um, and then in terms of your weather synopsis, looking at prognostic charts, surface analysis charts, help in that big picture view. This is a, a more detailed look at the uh, graphical air map product available at aviationweather.gov. You can see across the top, there's all these different filters and overlays we can look at from turbulence uh, to surface winds to icing, freezing level, mountain obscurations, IFR. And you can also use the left slider bar to scroll and, and show different altitudes. Or so if you're gonna be a low level below 10,000 feet, you can filter down, scroll down, and get the altitudes that are gonna be relevant to you. And you can also use the slider bar across the upper type right for a, kind of a timeline to look two, three, four hours, up to 12 hours out into the future as well. And this is that same product. This is a kind of an icing. Um, look at a little bit lower level, 9,000 feet uh, in some time into the future. Uh, pictures worth um, um, just so much more uh, in, in terms of how this is going to apply to you, how it's going to affect your route of flight. So these G Airmet tools have just been a, a tremendous uh, improvement to safety and, and awareness as opposed to the old straight raw textual formats. As we drill down into more detail for that weather briefing, um, of course, you'll want to note current conditions in the form of, of METARs, um, destination forecast in the form of, in the form of TAFs. Uh, we also have um, access to uh, model output statistics or MOS forecasts. So in other words, you're going to get TAF-like information at a lot more airports now than we once did. Um, Winds and temperatures aloft is another common report that you'll want to take a look at as well. And the in route uh, graphical forecast tool is another product um, that I'd like to point out that again gives us so much information in this pictorial format uh, in terms of where the good weather is versus where the poor weather is. Low IFR, IFR to marginal VFR conditions, we can offer different, we can apply different filters here and we can scroll out into the future here. Area forecasts are a thing of the past. If you remember the days of textual area forecasts, they are no more. Um, this is the primary graphical tool that has replaced that, which has uh, really been for the, for the better. This is another look at that, that graphic forecast tool uh, for in route planning. Again, that gives us, this is a kind of a combination of looking at wind information and, uh, also um, where the IFR, VFR, uh, marginal VFR weather information is here. Flight planning via the apps has gotten so much better by being able to take a look uh, doing this in, in pictorial and kind of point and click format. Um, so the type of, this is the type of data that we have the ability to look at now in terms of flight planning. Uh, this is a shot of both radar, of various air mats overlaid, and this is a clear indication of what we might experience on our route of flight. These charting apps give us the ability to um, kind of with a button click or a press and hold to to rubber band or, or change this change this routing to add different waypoints um, and really start looking at doing some of our longer range planning or working around different weather conditions a lot further out than we once were able to do. These charting apps give you the ability to, to edit not only uh, by that rubber banding feature and sliding your navigation line around, but they also give you the ability to do this um, uh, manually by adding different fixes. Uh, they give us access if you have the right aircraft profiles. They, they give you all this planning information, fuel burn, ground speeds, estimated time and routes. Uh, they have the ability to give us uh, cautionary look or profile views of, of obstructions and whether or not the altitude we flight planned at is going to be adequate for that particular flight, the list goes on and on. Again, your best option here is to go back to those original charting app sources and try these out for yourself to see how they, they are going to fit. Um, 
and then you know in route of course we already mentioned the ADSB and you also have access to some of the um, the paid subscription uh, service to via Sirius XM and there's also the old school flight service that hasn't gone away we no longer have flight watch uh, but you do have access to flight service station frequencies um, via the sectional chart and charting apps where you can still call and get help uh, another great in route resource you might consider is VFR flight following it allows for VFR aircraft to essentially get traffic advisory service from ATC on a workload permitting basis but it's just another uh, set of eyes another resource that you can um, you know, grab a hold of in the case that you need it I want to talk we're kind of getting into the home stretch I want to talk briefly a little about traffic pattern and radio communications uh, an emphasis area and has been for some time uh, are preventing runway incursions which are uh, essentially any kind of aircraft equipment vehicles etc um, operating or going on to some some active area active runway so as to create some kind of uh, collision hazard so it's been a hot button safety issue uh, for a number of years continues to be uh, the best source of, of preventing is again just a keen awareness of your surroundings and a, a, a careful plan for getting to where you need to be. Having your aircraft set up, um, anticipating ahead of time by studying air, airport layouts and even satellite imagery, um, what's the lay of the land, How? what type of clearance or what type of route or path am I likely to follow to um, to get to where I'm going to be and have everything set on the aircraft itself, GPS program, whatever the case may be, so you can taxi and move the aircraft around on the ground distraction free essentially. Um, also having your aircraft lit for, for good visibility is another way to help prevent runway incursions. And kind of the, the recommendations now, which have evolved uh, over the years, is that you have um, you know you have lights on for awareness um, and there's kind of a rundown whenever the engine's running of course the beacon and then as you start to move the aircraft you add different exterior lighting and whenever you're taking off or landing you should have all the exterior lights on the aircraft illuminated for visibility in the in the interest of practicing good collision avoidance not only do we want to spend most of our time outside of the aircraft and as you can see from all this great technology available to us in the in the cockpit the temptation has never been greater in terms of heads down spending time inside the airplane it's still necessary still a requirement still in the best interest of safety to see and avoid look out as much as you can and also good practice to um to follow those recommended um radio procedures as you're operating at non-towered airports uh specifically that um, the am calls for announcing your position as you're approaching an airport within 10 miles and then at uh, each leg of the traffic pattern and then when um, clearing the runway after landing and also it's recommended to be all lights on within 10 miles of the airport traffic patterns exist so we can all be predictable remember that um, it's so that it's not only um, to help us follow kind of a preset predetermined uh, discipline stabilized approach to landing but so that all the traffic around us approaching departing has the same type of expectation and, and can and can be aware and, and can reliably depend that this other airplane is going to do this that's kind of how the system has to function um, now it, you know always be defensive it can't be expected that everyone's going to do that but that's it that's that's why we have standard traffic patterns so i want to bring you back a little more interactivity a uh, little pop quiz I want to ask about departure pattern departure options traffic pattern departure departure options at non towered or pilot controlled airport I'm going to launch this poll into the field and let's see what kind of what what kind of answers we get from our audience here what are the uh, kind of AIM recommended or FAA accepted procedures for departing the traffic pattern at a non-towered or pilot controlled airport give you just a second for those results to come in
Okay, well, we didn't do quite as well on this one as I had hoped. So there's one correct answer here, and, and that answer choice is three. Um, so we probably had a, a, an equal amount or just a little bit more select option one. You may depart in any manner that does not impede other traffic or create a collision hazard. Um, you know, so the aeronautical information manual, and I was careful to put that uh, in the question itself. The aeronautical information manual only states two options for departing the traffic pattern. That doesn't necessarily make it illegal for doing it in a different manner, but again, back to my first point, if we're not all following the same kind of procedure and guidance, then it's hard to it's hard to plan appropriately. It's 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 hard to rely on other pilots to be flying it in kind of the the, the standard or same manner. But they provide two options, and that's straight out or at a 45 degree angle in the direction of the traffic pattern. So for left hand turns, that would be um, a left 45 degree angle. There's a look at your standard pattern entries. Uh, standard pattern entry. Uh, you're probably most accustomed to the 45 degree to the downwind leg. Somewhat recently, the FAA has endorsed uh, an alternate pattern entry if you're entering from the opposite side of the downwind leg. And they do say it is accepted practice to enter at pattern altitude, essentially at a midfield crosswind and turn to downwind as long as you're yielding to the downwind traffic. Um, so there's kind of the traditional um, method on the left-hand side of the screen, which would be entering that 45 degree downwind uh, or the alternate pattern entry, which I would fully endorse because it's just less low-level maneuvering and I think you have greater visibility, uh, a greater likelihood that you're able to be seen to come into that mid midpoint of, of the midfield crosswind leg and turn before turning a downwind. If you're used to the old uh, position and hold clearances that used to be issued by air traffic control, those are now gone. There is no such thing as position and hold anymore. It is now line up and wait. A couple very important points. Uh, line up and wait is not done at all towered fields. Uh, the FAA has gotten much more strict um, on the guidance, the rules for being able to utilize line up and wait procedures. So it can only be done at a towered airport and at a limited number of towered airports. And because it is an ATC function and only at towered airports, there is no such thing at non-towered airports. Uh, so if you're operating an airport, no control tower, you see or hear aircraft doing lineup and wait operations, that is really not a thing and certainly not something I would endorse or agree with in terms of safety. You never want to loiter uh, on an active runway. And again, as we kind of round things out for the evening, um, I want to kind of make mention, if you've been away from flying, uh, some of these things that you can help do so as not to find yourself back in a similar situation a year from now or two, year, two years from now, get yourself involved in the community, in the aviation community. And that doesn't necessarily have to be on the flight deck, preferably the flight deck. Uh, flying clubs uh, are definitely, um, the, the number of flying clubs that are available that are around are definitely on the rise. Um, there are resources that AOPA has available to help search out or find local flying clubs. Talk to your, your, your local, local friends, pilots at the airport. Find out who might be looking for partners or who might be looking for club members. There's also all kinds of way that we can serve the greater community um, through our abilities and skills as a pilot, volunteer flying, charitable flying, uh, local aviation chapters such as EAA, Women in Aviation have clubs at local airports. Um, and there's a lot of just good fun flying opportunities that get organized at local airports. So always something to be aware of, also local seminars. Um, breakfast, things like that at the airport. Anything to keep your mind active and thinking about airplanes and aviation goes a long way to, to keeping you active. Uh, some additional items um, to certainly consider if you've been away for some period of time. Um, I would certainly suggest or recommend not making it a secret, not going it alone. Uh, we all have some form of a personal support network. A lot of times that's a spouse, that's um, siblings, 
that's other loved ones, that's close friends, all those things. If you have the support of your support network, you're more likely to succeed, you're more likely to stick with it. So involve those people in any way you can in your aviation interest. Take them to the airport, take them flying, make them a part of the process. Uh, go find yourself a great aviation app. It's gonna make your life a heck of a lot easier when it comes to flight planning and accessing information. Loading your aircraft data um, saves a lot of repetitive steps. We highlighted it many times through the presentation, bare minimum legal FAR requirements doesn't come close in most cases uh, to, being, to, to mean it's safe. So establish your own um, personal minimums uh, and that, that, safe, that risk assessment, that FRAT tool that I pointed to, the single pilot uh, resource management tool I pointed you to is a great start. Subscribe to our free resources we have available to sporties that will help you think and explore uh, more about getting back into aviation, studentpilotnews.com, and if I've, I've piqued your curiosity more with some of the newer technology and, and iPad use, ipadpilotnews.com. Great free resources that you can subscribe to. And with that, a big thank you. We've we've kind of been some free flight review um, content as we're kind of on overtime right now, but I'm going to turn things back over to our facilitator, John Zimmerman. Thanks, Eric. Uh, unbelievable amount of information there in just over an hour. A um, lot of uh, questions we've handled behind the scenes here, so most folks are caught up. I'd say two that ca that came up uh, repeatedly have to do with one basic med, specifically Canada, uh, and it, I think you, you mentioned it. It's pretty clear that you know basic med, U.S., Bahamas, Mexico, okay. But just worth pointing out to folks that as of right now, basic med is not, at least as far as I'm aware, it's not accepted in Canada. I know the folks are working uh, at COPA there in Canada about potentially working on that. But as of right now, uh, not an option. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. The, uh, the only other one, uh, ADSB, really complicated topic, but a um, couple of just clarifications. And the one has to do with Class D. Class D in and of itself does not require ADS-B, but uh, maybe just worth reiterating that a lot of times Class D can be either within that 30-mile veil or right next to Class C airspace. So definitely want to be careful of where that Class D is located. Sure. And for the greater audience, too, I'll point out that for exploring many of the topics that we have touched on, whether it's weather, whether it's ADS-B specific, um, most likely, Sporties has an, a, a webinar dedicated to that topic. That certainly is the case for ADSB for weather, and you can find that on our YouTube channel, Sporties YouTube channel, or also in the Sporties webinar archives. Great, and I'll just uh, add on there for we've had a couple of folks asking about sporties uh recurrent courses and what we might have easiest thing to do is check out sporties.com discover that shows uh, all of our courses includes a free demo so if you want to check out our flight review course or the instrument proficiency check those among many others are available there at sporties.com discover you can check them out with that i think we'll wrap it up uh, eric thanks so much for your time and the presentation thanks to all of you for attending and joining us tonight hopefully we've got you inspired and uh, ready to get back out there and fly again uh, check for a recording of this webinar in the next day or so and check out sporties.com webinars we hope to see you again on another webinar this year we will have many many more to come thanks a lot and good night